Well, good afternoon. Happy Halloween. Yes, today is Halloween. And I decided that I'm just going to dress up today as the host of your show, North Star Oasis. And that's going to be my costume this year. Um, I was thinking about trying to find one of those Donald Trump costumes, but I really didn't feel that was fair or affordable. Well, you know, anything with a Trump name is not really all that affordable. So here I am, Jeff Williams, your host of North Star Oasis, here for another week and another jam-packed episode. And I want to welcome you to our show today. And I also want to remind all of our, our all of our viewers, new viewers, first-time viewers, and uh, recurring viewers, that we have all of our archives, all of our episodes are on YouTube, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. So what we're going to do today, we're going to start off with, uh, with um, oh, speaking of Halloween, um, we will not be having a Halloween scare show today, and uh, we kind of did a little bit of that last week when we were talking about the presidential campaign, uh, but since we have zero more days till Halloween, we do have only 54 more days left until Christmas. So now, even though we've been highlighting it all year long, now is the time to really start getting all of your Christmas lists in order. Even though after Labor Day, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stores have already been putting out hol uh, holiday stuff and Christmas stuff. Really, Halloween, uh, Halloween, Christmas shopping kind of begins at Halloween. That's when we start taking a look at that next 54 days of what we need to get through the rest of the year, you know, all the special people in our lives. So um, we're now in the Christmas season, folks. And really, uh, with an El Nino this year, strong El Nino, it should be actually pretty mild winter. That'll be nice, considering the last few that we've had have been uh, nothing to really um, sneeze about. Uh, as we have done on a recurring theme for the last 30-something weeks, we do only have 63 more weeks left until the next presidential retirement. That means, you know, President Barack Obama, per uh, one of the constitutional amendments, will not be allowed to run again. So his two terms will be expiring. He will be leaving office on the 20th of January, 2017. That is coming up only 63 weeks from now. But one thing we do on North Star Oasis is we try to keep you updated to what's going on in the presidential race and areas that you don't always see on local uh, media or the mainstream media. And whenever a candidate or one of their surrogates comes to town, we try to cover that as best we can. You know, there have been a couple of instances where we were not, you know, the candidates were here for a private event and we weren't able to cover them. But there, are, there have been times when a candidate or a representative of that campaign has come to town, we've been there. Um, most notably so far was when Bernie Sanders was here back in April and we were able to cover um, Senator Sanders' visit. Well today we are going to show you video of Rafael Cruz, which is Ted Cruz's father, who was here a few weeks ago uh, at the machine shed in uh, Lake Elmo. So we're going to go right to the video. So here is Rafael Cruz at the machine shed. And actually, it started as a beautiful morning, bright sunshine, <laughs> and I'm enjoying the great 50 degree weather. We don't have the hot and muggy weather I left behind in Texas, so it's been great. Great to be here with you. And uh, <clears throat> I was telling someone a little while ago, you know, I remember when Reagan got elected that we had such an overwhelming sweep that the map was all red, against, except for a little speck of blue. And we need to redeem that little speck of blue. Minnesotans can do that. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, as, as you heard, I grew up in a very oppressive military dictatorship. As a result, I was involved in the revolution, was imprisoned, tortured, but by the grace of God, I was able to leave Cuba in 1957 and come to America. I remember during that time, there was this young charismatic leader talking about hope and change. His name was Fidel Castro, and we all followed him, thinking that he was going to be our liberator. Little did we know. Well, after he took over, I went back to Cuba in 1959. And this same guy that had talked about hope and change was now talking about how the rich were evil, about how they oppressed the poor, and about the need to redistribute the wealth. Began attacking freedom of the press, began attacking freedom of religion, began confiscating private property. So after three weeks, I left Cuba, never to return again, but so happy to be in the land of the free the home of the brave, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Yes. I'm so proud to be in America. Let me tell you, America is absolutely the greatest country on earth. How dare our president say America is not an exceptional country? Yeah. This is the most exceptional country in the world. It's the country where with hard work and perseverance, all your dreams can become a reality. And then when he turned 13, we introduced him to an organization called the Free Enterprise Institute. Ted had just turned 13. He's reading Adam Smith and John Locke and Von Mises and Hayek and Bastiak and Montesquieu and Milton Friedman and the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. And then this organization created a group of five kids. They called them the Constitutional Corroborators. They hired a memory expert and taught these five kids, my son Ted was one of them, to memorize the entire U.S. Constitution. For the next four years, they traveled to the state of Texas. They would go to a luncheon meeting, normally a Rotary Club or something like that. They would put five easels in the front of the room, and while people were having lunch, they would write the Constitution by memory on those easels and then give a half hour patriotic speech on free market economics and the Constitution. During the next four years, they did approximately 80 speeches on free market <coughs> economics and the Constitution. Before my son left high school, he was passionate about the Constitution. He was passionate about the Declaration, about free markets, about limited government, about the rule of law. And that passion became like fire in his bones. I believe we have one exceptional candidate that stands head and shoulders above the rest. And I'll tell you why I believe that. We have to look beyond the rhetoric. It's very interesting. You look at the debates and you have a dozen people standing on the, on the debate platform they all sound that they are to the right of Ronald Reagan. Every one of them is what my son calls campaign conservatives. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. All of them will tell you what you want to hear. They'll tickle your ears. We need to look beyond the rhetoric and look at the record. Don't believe what any politician tells you. Look at what they have done and look what they, what they do. Jesus put it this way. Ye shall know them by their fruit. It's about time we do some fruit checking. <laughs> Whether it is fighting for the First Amendment rights of free speech or for the First Amendment rights of freedom of religion, my son has been at the forefront of protecting freedom of religion in America, which is under attack. Whether it is protecting the Second Amendment rights to keep and bear arms. Let me tell you, my son has been at the forefront of protecting the Second Amendment. Back when the Heller decision was taking place in Washington, D.C., my son led a coalition of 31 states before the Supreme Court and won on the Heller decision. When Newtown occurred, Ted was a member of the minority party, 
when the Newtown massacre occurred. The Republican leadership was saying in the Senate, gun control is inevitable. There's nothing we can do about it. My son, as the member of the minority party in committee, won that battle. Some of you may remember his exchange against Dianne Feinstein, who was the one that was spearheading all the gun control legislation. He tore down her arguments so effectively that she lost her marbles and began screaming, I'm not a sixth grader. And as a result of that, zero passed on gun control. He did that as a member of the minority. Whether it is fighting to cut down the size, power, and scope of the federal government and restore those powers back to the states. Whether it is fighting to try to destroy this horrible deal with Iran that Barack Obama has made. You know, I'll tell you what, Barack Obama and what's his name, Big Face, you know, oh, this is either this deal or war. It is exactly the opposite. This deal guarantees war. Amen. This deal guarantees war because it guarantees that Iran will get the bomb. And if they get the bomb, they will use it, not only against Israel, but also against us. It also guarantees that Iran continues to build ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. They don't need an ICBM to bomb, bomb Israel. Any little old rocket will do. They only need ICBMs for one reason, and that's to bomb us. What Obama and Kerry have done is they have violated their oath of office. They promised to protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. They violated that that oath. He will remove and get rid of the thousands upon thousands of regulations of the APA and OSHA and all those organizations that are strangling small businesses in America. If you get rid of taxes and regulations and you allow Americans to keep more money in their pocket, it will unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of America to where private individuals will start creating new businesses and creating millions of jobs and restore opportunity and jobs in America. You know, we saw it in 1980 when Reagan took power. Under Carter, average GDP was 1.1% a year. Reagan cut taxes from 72% to 28%, two thirds. Cut regulations, as a matter of fact, revenue to the government increased because there were millions of more people working. By the fifth year of Reagan, eight million new jobs have been created in the private sector and GDP was growing at 7.2% a year. We did it in 1980, we can do it again. And let me tell you, we have a great advantage over 1980. In 1980, we didn't have internet, we didn't have email, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have bloggers, we didn't even have conservative radio. We have a lot of avenues today that we can go around the liberal media and get the message out to we the people. And let me tell you, we are ready to take America back. So Ted is really running against the Washington cartel as I said, corrupt career politicians in both parties. This is a fight to restore power to we the people. To we the people. 
Because I'll tell you what, we need to send a clear message to Washington that they work for us, we don't work for them. But I'll tell you why Ted is the, more, the most viable. I think Ted is the best position to recreate the Reagan coalition. Broad spectrum support. And then let's look at viability. Do you know which was the campaign that raised the most money the first quarter that we had uh, recording, which was June 30th? It wasn't Jeb Bush, it was Ted Cruz. As of June 30th, Ted Cruz had raised $14.3 million. Second was Jeb Bush with $11 million. But here's the difference. Ted Cruz's $14.3 million came from over 175,000 donations. Average donation, $81. Jeb Bush's $11 million, the average donation was over $900. That translates to about 12,000 donations. That's 12,000 compared to 175,000 offers. Not only that, Ted Cruz campaign now has about 6,000 donors that are giving monthly and are covering 100% of all the overhead of the campaign to where all the money that is being raised is going to be used to campaign all across the nation. <coughs> So Ted has the money to go the course. As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you, none of you have seen my son Ted speak one ill word against any of the candidates. He has stayed positive. He was the only one. Every time a candidate announced, he put a press release praising them and saying something positive about them and he will not attack any one of those. He is going to run a positive campaign, focus on the issues, focus on the difference in policy, focus on why you need to elect a constitutional conservative who will stand for the Constitution, for the rule of law, for limited government, for restoring power to the American people. If we do that, we are going to restore America to that shining city on a hill. So I'll tell you, together, if the men and women in this room can turn Minnesota, can turn America around and restore the greatness of America again, we must do that. So I'm asking you, let's coalesce around this candidate that has already the money and the organization in place and the vision and the integrity to restore America to, again, leadership in the world, to make sure America has the strongest military on the face of the earth because that's the only way we preserve peace, to make sure that America is respected, not laughed at across the world to make sure that people again can be proud to be Americans and to where every American can see their dreams become a reality. Where we have a government that represents all of the people. Because it should be a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. We can do that again if we elect Ted Cruz as the next, next president of the United States. So I, I'll tell you what, thank you for your time. I want to open it up for questions. I will answer any question you have, and we'll do that as long as you want to. Yes, sir. Thank you. One thing that kind of led me to be a conservative was, uh, as I began to know God more, and he really, heart, really began to you know, grip my heart regarding the issue of abortion. And I realized that the, the, you know, night and day of where the parties stand. Uh, but then I also saw the compromise within the Republican Party, which disgusted me with um, supporting exceptions and ex supporting abortion in certain cases, which really kind of, uh, I feel like the movement's raising up, as you know, the Planned Parenthood thing. There, our generation is knowing that 
um, the issue of abortion, the issue of killing children. God can't bless, bless a nation that continues to do that. He has said plenty about it. He has said repeatedly that he believes that life begins at conception and that every life is worth saving. But well, let me tell you what. Again, I said earlier, look at the record. Ever since my son was a Solicitor General of Texas, he fought in favor of parental notification. He fought to keep the ban of, on partial birth abortion that uh, Bush had put into place and that the liberals wanted to get rid of. He had to take it to Supreme Court. He has been at the forefront to not only defund but prosecute Planned Parenthood for the butchering of babies aborted alive to harvest body parts even under today's laws, that is murder. And he has been at the forefront of the battle for life. And he just continues to lead in that area. There's no one that has taken a higher leadership position on Planned Parenthood than Ted Cruz. Sure. Okay, uh, you said that Ted would um, rein in the uh, unelected bureaucracies. Would he get rid of all the czars? Well, the czars, I don't see that in the Constitution anywhere. <laughs> As a matter of the question is very simple. Ted is a strict constitutionalist. As a matter of fact, let me say something. If you look at Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, that's called the enumerated powers of Congress. There are 18 powers enumerated in Article 1, Section 8. If it ain't there, Federal government's got no business being involved in it. Like, for example, you take Common Core. Well, let me tell you one word that is not in Article 1, Section 8. It's the word education. The Department of Education is unconstitutional. It should be gotten rid of. Let me tell you another word. And by the way, Common Core is not really about standards. Common Core is about control and about brainwashing our kids with secular humanism, with all these socialistic ideas that are being brainwashed to the kids. And Ted Cruz has also promised Common Core will be a same thing of the past the day he takes office. Shipman back here. Yes. Does uh, Ted Cruz have a plan to sway the moderate Democrats like Ronald Reagan did in the 80s and 84 to lean over to the more conservative bent? And well, let, let me say this. There is, I'm not going to call them moderate Democrats. There are a lot of Democrats that are what were called Reagan Democrats. They weren't really moderate Democrats. They were conservative Democrats that were Democrats because of tradition. They were Democrats because their parents voted Democrats and their grandparents voted Democrats. Even though the Democratic Party of today is not the Democratic Party of JFK. But I'll tell you something. I was in uh, New Hampshire. No, in Florida. I was in Orlando. There was a man that came to the front of the room in a meeting such as this, and he said, I've been a Democrat all my life. <clears throat> I've been a member of the Teamsters Union for 40 years. And I'm coming here to tell you that myself, my wife, and my kids, we're all voting for Ted Cruz. We're seeing that all across the nation. Let me tell you where I really see it. When Ted is doing a real large meeting, say a thousand plus people, typically if he do, if does a big event in a city, the city will provide security because they don't want an incident. And they insist that Ted does not walk through the crowd, but that he comes through the back of the stage. I have walked through the back of the stage with Ted where there are no cameras, no media, nobody. And you see boss boys, maids, janitors stopping and holding Ted and saying, thank you for fighting for me. The grassroots is with Ted. The average American hardworking men and women of America are with Ted Cruz because Ted Cruz 
wants to restore dignity to them and give them the jobs and opportunity to achieve their dreams. Ted Cruz will represent every American. And I'll tell you what, that's what we need. Not special interests, but to represent every American. Anybody else? Yes. Well, what I'm really impressed with is the fact that when Ted Cruz was young, as related in this clip, just in case you missed it, you know, that he would, he and his friends would write down the Constitution and he memorized it word for word and then studied the meaning and the history behind it. That, to me, is extremely impressive. And I don't care who you are, if you're doing something like that and able to recite it right, you know, right off of memory, that is extremely impressive. Now, at one point in time, I did happen to have the Gettysburg Address down but, uh, and the preamble to the Constitution, but that's nowhere anywhere near what Ted Cruz is able to pull off um, from the time he was a youth. So that alone is impressive. And a couple of things that uh, Rafael Cruz mentioned, we've actually covered, especially the Iran deal. You go to our March 21st and April 4th episodes, and we were actually covering the Iran deal before you know, a lot of the other places were. And then uh, our commentary on Ted Cruz as a candidate himself was our May 2nd episode. So all of those are available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. So uh, while you're figuring out who's going to be the next president in the next 63 weeks, there was an important election that was just held last week, just the other day, in, in fact. And so the Speaker of the House, as we had even covered on this show, um, John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House, had announced his resignation a month ago, and the U.S. House of Representatives held another election. And let's see how it went. Thankfully, I had a gavel. <laughs> Pursuant to the Speaker's announcement, uh, the Chair will receive nominations for Office of the Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today in the People's House, it gives me great honor to nominate the People's Speaker. And I can say, in all candor, he did not seek this office. The office sought him. As Chair of the House Republican Conference, I am directed by a vote of that conference to present for election to the Office of Speaker for the House of Representatives for the 114th Congress, the representative from the state of Wisconsin, the man from Janesville, the Honorable Paul D. Ryan. Gowdy. Mr. Ryan. Ryan. Boehner. Ryan. The tellers agree in their tallies that the total number of votes cast is 432, of which the Honorable Paul D. Ryan of the state of Wisconsin has received 236, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi of California has received 184, the Honorable, Honorable Daniel Webster of the state of Florida has received nine. Therefore, the Honorable Paul D. Ryan of the state of Wisconsin, having received a majority of the votes cast, is duly elected as Speaker of the House. So Paul I am now ready to take the oath of... Wow, okay. So Paul Ryan, Wisconsin Congressman, the uh, former vice presidential candidate under Mitt Romney from 2012, is now your Speaker of the House. And we're going to go right on to what Speaker Ryan has said in his uh, introductory remarks. I am now ready to take the oath of office. I ask that the Dean of the House of Representatives, the Honorable John Conyers, Jr. of Michigan, to administer the oath of office. Hey, John. Thank you. If the gentleman from Wisconsin would please raise his right hand. Do you, sir, solemnly swear or affirm that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, 
that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? For what purpose does the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy, seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I offer a privileged resolution and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. The, first, the clerk will first number the resolution. House Resolution 503, resolved that the clerk be instructed to inform the President of the United States that the House of Representatives has elected Paul D. Ryan, a representative from the state of Wisconsin, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Without objection, the resolution is agreed to and the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. After CNN and NBC. And so now uh, Paul Ryan is the Speaker of the House. Now one thing I have to say about the whole Speaker's election, and it's a contrast between the way the Republicans and the Democrats run things. The Democratic Party is very top-down driven. By that I mean whatever leadership decides, the membership must decide. And we see that with labor unions. Labor union management, I mean, you have to vote according to the way that the labor unions want you to vote if you are a labor union member because we are centralized top-down management. We are centralized top-down leadership. That's the way it is amongst the Democratic Party. And this is just an observation that the Democrats are very centrally organized and very top-down driven. Republicans, on the other hand, are completely the opposite. They are bottom up. You have a lot of people, a lot of individuals who have a lot of great ideas and a lot of things, and sometimes not so great ideas, but a lot of things that they bring to the table and they want to be the ones to spearhead the, dis the decision making up the chain of leadership. And when you try to govern as, as a Republican like a Democrat governs from top down, you have pushback and problems. And the Republican Party, in the way the, um, the House of Representatives is structured, they have a lot of different caucuses and a lot of diverse ideolo ideology amongst the membership going from the more moderate Northeastern uh, Republicans like Peter King from New York all the way to you know, your, um, your um, mid-level people, which I would, I would classify, you know, a Republican delegation from Minnesota in, um, where they just get along, go along, uh, compared to your conservative faction, your libertarian-oriented faction, uh, Justin Amash from Michigan, and a few other libertarian-leaning uh, Republicans that have actually call themselves the Freedom Caucus. And then you also have your Social Conservative Caucus, your pro-life, anti-gay marriage, uh, uh, fundamental Christian-based um, voting bloc in, in the caucus. So you got four or five different coalitions, and everybody wants to tell the speaker how to do their job. And when you have, it, it's hard to find anybody who comes out of any of those factions that's not going to upset the apple cart with the other factions. So if you have somebody from the Freedom Caucus, uh, like Daniel Webster, who runs, well, he's not exactly going to be accepted by a moderate Republican from New York. You're not going to necessarily see a moderate who's accepted by somebody from the Midwest, like um, Tom Emmer. And so you have all of these different people who are jockeying around trying to assert influence on the speakership. 
And Paul Ryan so far seems to be the only one who's been able to navigate those waters to try to bridge the gaps and the differences within the Republican Party. And we'll see how that translates as he asserts himself as Speaker of the House. But let's take a look at again on the Democrat side. It's what Nancy Pelosi wants is what the Democrats in Congress vote for. You know, what does President Barack Obama want? He wants top business control. I mean, he wants the government business control at the top. Take a look at the General Motors bailout and the Cash for Clunkers program and even the uh, establishment of the Affordable Care Act. Whatever President Obama wants, because he is the leading Democrat in charge of Washington, is, I'm, well, I'm the leader. I'm a Democrat leader, and this is what I want. And I expect everybody to follow along. I expect Nancy Pelosi to give me what I want. I expect Harry Reid to give me what I want. And, of course, those two leaders will then look at their delegation and say, well, this is what the boss wants. We must give it to him. But when you, when you have to get Republicans aboard, and they're all saying, well, we want a seat at the table, too, and we want to be able to influence our, or assert some of our influence and our ideas into this, well, that doesn't exactly fly with the top-down structure of the Democratic Party. So what we're seeing here is for the Republican side in Congress, you actually have a member of Congress on the, you know, again, the Republican caucus who managed to get 236 of the votes needed, 218 were actually the minimum needed to win election. And he managed to navigate the waters of fractured caucuses amongst his side of the aisle. How is that going to translate to his governance? We're going to find out, but with, with um, Paul Ryan, he seems to be more of an inclusive person. I don't think he wants to look at the Democrats necessarily as a complete enemy, but he also knows that he can't treat them like his friends. And it's going to be an interesting coalition to see, or an interesting process to see how Ryan uh, governs as speaker. I don't think he's going to be as punitive as John Boehner was to members of his own caucus. So he, he's got a lot of work cut out for him, but really I think this is a good choice. Um, he, he reminds me of a, a lot of um, Newt Gingrich without the combativeness from uh, Newt's speaker days. So I, I really wish Paul Ryan, all the best. He's got himself in a difficult position. But then again, when you're the Speaker of the House, nobody's happy. And you're the one who's got to lead this body as uh, you still have a couple of other branches of government to contend with. So best of luck to Paul Ryan. And uh, I hope he succeeds. And, of course, last week we also had a major debate. And we're going to show you, um, well, actually, I'm going to show you something that happened two years ago. And this is Republican National Committee Chairman Reince Priebus. After CNN and NBC announced plans for a documentary and miniseries on Hillary Clinton, the Republican National Committee Chairman had this to say. If they want to move forward and spend millions of dollars promoting one particular candidate before the 2016 election, and we're going to do what we want to do, and we're just going to shut them out of our debates. If it wasn't political, then they should just wait a couple years and see what she does. I mean, certainly in two years, they'll know whether or not Hillary is going to run, and then they can do it then. I think we have a right to protect the brand of the Republican Party and to protect our candidates. And I think we have to stand up for ourselves instead of sitting around and letting these networks uh, do whatever they want. Want, slap us around and then depose our candidates uh, in a 23 debate circus. If you're sitting in my seat, you make a judgment call and you look at two networks that's saying they're going to make a mini series, some of which uh, I've heard there are, going to, are going to be a four day mini series, a full blown movie and documentary. Um, you you got to believe that it's all not going to be negative. I think it's pretty fair for me to take this position. I don't exactly think mm -hmm. it's that earth shattering. The only thing is, I'm not going to yeah. sit around and continue to get slapped in the face by these people without standing up for the rights of our party. Well, CNN uh, has replied to the RNC uh, saying the party should not jump to conclusions about the piece. NBC also responded saying that NBC News is independent of NBC Entertainment and has no involvement with the project. Well, that was uh, what happened two years ago that NBC, CBS, um, NBC and CNN were going to do these documentaries. I don't think the documentaries were created, but there was a threat 
And the threat was, we're not going to let you moderate our, and host our debates and make money off of Republican presidential candidates. That was two years ago. Well, guess what? CNBC hosted the debate last week. And we're going to show you uh, one clip here. Well, that was a, probably the most famous uh, clip that we've seen from the other night's um, president, Republican presidential debate. First of all, I want to call attention to when Ted Cruz mentions the Bolsheviks versus the Mensheviks. And when you go back to 1904, prior to the Communist Revolution of 1917, you had the Russian Social Democrat Labor Party. You had Vladimir Lenin and uh, Julius Martov were the two faction leaders. And Lenin and Martov, they had, they really had two, kind of like I was just mentioned about the Republican split. Well, the Russians were split with the, the well, essentially the Communist Party, uh, the Russian Social Democrat Labor Party. Lenin took the Bolsheviks and a little over a decade later had the Communist Revolution. At the same time, Martov was leading the Mensheviks. And really, it's the same thing. It's just two factions of the same thing. So the Bolsheviks versus the Mensheviks, what Cruz is trying to say is that the Democrats are acting like Lenin and Martov, that they may be disagreeing amongst themselves, but they still have the same ideology and they're not really any different than each other. That's really what um, Ted Cruz is trying to get across. But the other thing is this whole thing about the uh, debates. Um, and debates used to be back in the Lincoln-Douglas days. You would bring the candidates together and they would have like 90 minutes for one candidate and 90 minutes for the other and they would really be you know, into the issues and into the ideology. That was what a debate was. Then over the decades we've gone over to forums where the forums would be, you ask one question and all of the candidates would answer, but there was really no conflict like there were with the debates. Well, now we have debates again. These are debates, but instead of debating issues, now we're debating personalities, and now we're going candidate to moderator clashes as the candidates and the moderators debate. That's really what this is coming down to, and unfortunately, I think it's a really sad state of affairs. Uh, let's take a look now. How, how does Reince Priebus respond to this? RNC Chairman Reince Priebus wrote a letter to NBC Chairman Andrew Lack today and blasted CNBC's handling of the Republican debate on Wednesday. Priebus wrote, The CNBC network is one of your media properties and its handling of the debate was conducted in bad faith. We understand that NBC does not exercise full editorial control over CNBC's journalistic approach. However, the network is an arm of your organization and we need to ensure there is not a repeat performance. During and after Wednesday night's debate, the candidates and GOP officials lashed out at CNBC for the handling of the debate format and their line of questioning. NBC was scheduled to host a February 26th debate at University of Houston. Priebus said that debate will go on, but on another network. And uh, that, of course, is what a plan put. We have uh, as a response from Reince Priebus. Essentially, the same threat as what happened two years ago, and this time it appears that he may back it up. Where uh, the preliminary indication is the February debate on NBC is canceled. I can't remember which affiliation of NBC it was, and the RNC is looking for new moderators and trying to figure out a new platform. And I have a story here. Uh, let me just give a couple of quotes from some of the candidates about what they think. Uh, from Lindsey Graham's campaign manager, I think the campaigns have a number of concerns and they have a right to talk about that amongst themselves um, and to find out what works best for us as a group. And hold on here. And... My 
there I had it my computers my computer froze up here um Jindal spokesman Gail Gitcho our continuous complaint is candidate exclusion and the delusional debate polling criteria it's unacceptable maybe this meeting will change that maybe it won't but we aren't going to shut up about it uh Ben Carson it's not about me and gotcha questions it's about the American people and whether they have the right to hear what we think uh, the whole format was just craziness. You got to be really bad for the whole crowd to boo you. Uh, Carson's campaign manager. I think the families need to get together here because these debates, as structured by the RNC, are not helping the party. There's not enough time to talk about your plans. There's no presentation. It's just a slugfest. All we do is change moderators, and the trend line is horrific. I think there needs to be wholesale change here. Uh, Marco Rubio, I think the bigger frustration you saw is that all those candidates on stage had prepared for a substantive debate. Everyone was ready to talk about trade policy and the debt and tax policies. And we're ready for that. Everybody was. And then you've got questions that everyone got which were clearly designed to get us to fight against each other or get us to say something embarrassing about us and then get us to react. And then uh, Mike Huckabee, the campaigns are not going to allow the networks to control this process. Owen oh, Trump even uh, uh, made his statement. Um, everybody said it was going to be three hours, three and a half, including them. And in about two minutes, I renegotiated so we can get that out of there. He said, not bad. So that's what's going on with the uh, debates. I think for the Republicans, there's been long-standing need to change the way the debate formats go. Uh, we remember the Cal Ca Candy Crowley debate from 2012 when she cut uh, Governor Mitt Romney off mid-sentence when he wanted to press about Benghazi but, and then said, we'll come back to that, but never did. And I think Republicans overall are... I'm going to be pleased if um, Reince Priebus sticks to this along with the campaigns. But we did have some uh, breaking news this week, and that is uh, right there. Fed's possible link in Wetterling case. 26 years ago, Jacob Wetterling, a 12-year-old boy from the St. Cloud area, St. Joseph, was abducted, and nobody has seen him since. And a year ago, we had the feds who got together, and they actually may have a major breakthrough in the case. Let's go to the film. With a major development in the disappearance of Jacob Wetterling. The 11-year-old boy went missing in 1989, and it has been a mystery since. Now, police have arrested this man, Danny James Heinrich. And we need to be clear here, he is charged with possession of child pornography, not Wetterling's disappearance. But prosecutors say he is a person of interest. Fox 9's Paul Bloom at the news conference for us earlier today. He starts our team coverage tonight. Paul, this is a big deal on a lot of levels. In terms of Jacob Wetterling case, a big deal, Amy. Potentially a huge break in the case if things play out correctly. That man, Danny Heinrich, who you mentioned, was arrested last night at his home in Annandale. That's up in Wright County on those child porn charges. It turns out back in 1989, investigators gave this guy a close look, gave him the up and down in terms of the Wetterling abduction. They checked his footprints, his tire prints, but they couldn't at that point find the evidence to link him 100% to the Wetterling abduction. Tonight, though, he sits behind bars. A federal search warrant that Fox 9 has obtained lays out the roadmap in terms of how and why investigators are giving him a fresh look right now. We consider him to be a person of interest in the Wetterling abduction. After 26 years, the words were stunning to hear from the FBI. This man, Danny Heinrich, arrested last night, possibly connected to Minnesota's greatest unsolved mystery, the disappearance of Jacob Wetterling. But authorities stopped short of calling Heinrich a full-blown suspect. Let me very, be very clear. The defendant has denied any involvement in the disappearance of Jacob Wetterling and is not charged at this time with any crime related to that disappearance. What Heinrich is charged with federally at the moment is child pornography. Authorities searched his Annandale home back in July in connection to the Wetterling case. It turns out Heinrich had been looked at and interrogated shortly after the 11-year-old was taken at gunpoint. Cold case investigators determined for some reason Heinrich deserved a second look all these years later. 
The search warrant details what law enforcement was looking for. Chillingly, it includes Jacob's remains and the boy's clothing. What they found were reams of child porn. Additionally, a DNA sample connected Heinrich to a previously unsolved kidnapping and sexual assault case involving a young boy in Cold Spring some nine months before Wetterling's abduction. Mr. Heinrich was looked at very closely back in 1989 and 1990, so this isn't somebody new to us. In fact, Heinrich was looked at so closely nearly three decades ago that the FBI had examined his shoe and tire prints, comparing it to evidence from the Wetterling crime scene. While they were said to be a potential match, investigators didn't have quite enough to arrest him at that point. We will not rest as an investigative team until we bring Jacob home. As for that sexual assault, he has now been linked to by DNA. Prosecutors said, unfortunately, the statute of limitations on that case have run out, thus no charges. Authorities would not comment today on why they're finally putting out Heinrich's name publicly as it relates to Wetterling. Obviously, those child porn charges, the search warrants, the court documents make that public. So I feel like they had to go out in front of the cameras to talk about that. Again, not calling him a suspect at this point, just a person of interest. The Wetterling family, law enforcement, pleading with anybody who remembers Danny Heinrich from the late 1980s and early 1990s to call authorities if they have even possibly the slightest shred of details about his whereabouts and potential connection to Jacob Wetterling's disappearance. And I've uh, covered, I've watched this uh, unfold over the last 26 years. I did not grow up in Minnesota. I grew up in Michigan, and literally, I moved here at the end of June. Uh, of 1989 and right out of high school came to the Twin Cities haven't left and it was uh, late October of that same year so a couple of months after I moved here was when the Jacob Wetterling case broke and you know, we've seen Patty Wetterling run for Congress a couple of times we've you know seen the Wetterlings and we you know over the over the years as New leads would be brought out and hopes would be dashed. And so far, this looks to be the most convincing case yet. Yeah, I was even looking, uh, Joy Baker on joybaker.com, she went through and looked at the Cold Spring murders on her blog, or uh, the, the murders, the abductions uh, that happened just before the Wetterling case and saw that there may be linkage there. She came out with this whole thing about a year and a half ago, and there was a compare. There was the sketch that was made at that time of 1989 of Wedling's disappearance. And if you were to look at the guy that they got, uh, Heinrich, if you were to take a look at his photo today and you look at the 1989 photo, you see a strong resemblance. And even in that video that we had just shown you, that there was a strong resemblance from the guy uh, from as he looked in 1989 to that photograph. So. Just based upon that sketch, artist, you know, they may, they've got a really strong case here, and we'll be interesting to see how this all holds out. Well, that's our show for this week. So go to youtube.com slash Northstar Oasis, and we will see you next week.